Most Awakened Podcast with your host, Bill Real. Surrender is a very deep topic. In fact, some masters of many different traditions have said that the ultimate and highest spiritual path is the path of surrender. My experience is that very few people understand surrender. They misunderstand it tremendously. They see it as a weakness. They see it as giving in to somebody else. We're going to spend this entire course, which will give us plenty of time together, not defining surrender for you, but letting, taking you on a journey whereby you will learn surrender. You will learn surrender. And what I found out was that it really wasn't enough, that even being at her alone in the woods with myself, I was just causing myself a lot of trouble. I didn't need other people to help. I was doing very well by myself. So for example, I'd be sitting there and I was meditating many hours a day, and there'd be a dog barking, and the dog would bother me. And my mind would be sitting there saying, God, I made all this effort to move out in the middle of nowhere, and now there's this dog barking. Why do neighbors have their dogs bark? What am I gonna do about this? Oh my God, now I'm out here and there's dogs barking and just causing the same kind of commotion it did about people and about everything else. Why would our Heavenly Father do that to anyone? And then it started bothering me about whether I was meditating enough. You know, you committed yourself to this, you know, you shouldn't be eating so much, you should be doing it. And I just noticed that that voice inside my head, which is actually how I got on this path, by noticing there was a voice talking inside my head, and I decided I wanted to shut it up. I, I don't think I need to tell you about that voice. You all know about it. You have one in there bothering you. But here it was in the middle of nowhere, it's bothering me still. So I came to the point, eventually, where I realized, I realized, 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 realized. Here we are, we're sitting here this morning, Bill Real and Glenn Osland. And uh, we had this conversation, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago. And the, I've had people reach out to me and say they really enjoyed that conversation. And you it reached out to me. It changed the world, Bill. Well, I don't. It changed yeah, I don't, the world. I, um, I don't think so. But yeah, you know, one of the things that you and I have gotten into <laughs> thinking about these kinds of ideas is the realization of how miraculous it is that our consciousness in this very moment is here, but also how small and unimportant we are to the entire scheme of things. I don't think anything you or I could do would impact the world in the way you're speaking, although we're always impacting what happens in the future because every movement, in other words, if, if, the, if the bazillion moments that came before didn't happen exactly the way they did, you and I wouldn't be sitting here. Well, that's one way of looking at it, Bill. Another way of looking <laughs> at it <laughs> is that the sound of our voice was recorded and it digitally went into thousands of people's of ear. <laughs> How can I say this? It's early in the morning for me. I'm almost awakened right now. Yeah, it, just, just to give everybody a heads up, it is 6.30 in the morning here for you, Glenn. Yeah, 7.30 right. for me, so I got an extra hour of sleep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what, what was it that I, I messed up saying? That uh, our... The audio the, going the, into the ears. Yeah, the, the audio went into their ears and is now stored in their subconscious brains. It's there forever, always. Yeah. Yeah. And so now when they use conscious altering tools, this new truth can come back out and explore itself in new ways. Well, and it, it changed their minds. Yeah. It impacted their minds. It went in. It made an impact. It's there. Whether it's a conscious memory or not, boom, you're different. Look at that. Look at you're us different. changing it the world. Changed the world. Not the whole world. And I didn't say whether the change was good or bad or significant or insignificant. Yeah, just the 3,000 listeners of mine and the 42,000 listeners of yours. Oh, right, 42,000, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so as I listened to, so you, you had reached out to me and said, like, let's have this conversation. And it's Michael Singer, right? Michael Singer, the author of The Untethered Soul, yes. And he does this uh, multi-part series where he is trying to get people to surrender. That's yeah, the, that's the word he uses. Yeah, he's talking, he, and and he's, he says at the beginning he's not really going to define what surrender is. He's just going to talk about it. By the end of this eight course series, you'll know, you'll understand. Yeah, and uh, that was my experience with it. Yeah, so, and so yeah, you I sent me the to it back in June. Yeah, you sent me the first three and said, "Let's have a conversation about those." Yeah, and and. I really wished you had sent me all of them just so I could keep listening because I was kind of I on know. the edge of my seat, See, but you've teased me. It. So, uh -huh. uh, so part one, he is trying to introduce his audience to uh, this idea of surrendering, but he has to do a lot of setup. And so part one is essentially this idea that you are not anything with form 
nor are you anything with form that you're observing outside of yourself. You're not your own form. You're not the forms outside of yourself. You're not even the thoughts about those forms. Um, and he went through the exercise and I was telling you, I don't know if you were recording at the time, but I was telling you that in college, I took a bunch of religious classes like, um, uh, religions of the world and that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. I remember, I can't remember what religion, but I think it was Buddhism. And the professor did this exercise where he said, okay, are, are, who are you? And we went through the exercise of saying, are you your arm? And, and we mentally tried to think through if my, if I lost my left arm, am I still me? And the answer is yes. And Michael Singer goes through this practice, uh, this exercise of getting his audience to sense that we are not any piece or part of us. We're not our liver. We're not our spleen. We're not, we might cease to show up in the world consciously differently if enough things are taken away from us. For instance, we could die, but we are not any of these things. And he even goes to the extreme measure of saying, look, I, let's pretend for a moment you need surgery. And I'm the guy who knows exactly how the surgery gets done, but I do a trick. I cover you all up and um, while you're under surgery, I remove everything. I hook you up to a heart machine and a lung machine because I've taken everything away and all you are is your, your spine and your head. And as long as I don't show you what I've done to you when you wake up and I go, hey, how are you doing? You go, oh, I'm doing great. How'd the surgery go? And uh, at that point, he you know, un, un pulls back the blanket and shows you that everything's been taken. And, and now, because you're aware that that's happened, you go into uh, an extreme amount of anxiety, you feel trauma, you uh, search for, for reasons for why this could have happened. But up until your knowledge that that had occurred, you're still you. And, and so there's through this exercise, and again, having done this in college, there's this recognition that we are not anything other than whatever's behind our eyes watching all of this unfold. And as you keep pointing out, I just got done listening to your Bathing uh, with God episode with uh, this, the guy with street epistemology. And it was oh, yeah. fun. It was fun to hear him ask you questions. And, and I know what street epistemology is and, and the direction he's trying to walk you and state your confidence. And by the end, your confidence is lower. And it was interesting during that conversation to listen to him do some oohs and ahs as you're beginning to say things that are making some stirrings inside his brain. He's going, hmm, huh, hmm, what? Like he's starting to realize like, oh, maybe, maybe there's just something new here to what Glenn's saying that I should wrestle with. And so in this episode one with Singer, the audience by the end, you're going to walk away going, the only thing I am is because I'm not my body. I'm not any of the outside world. I'm not my thoughts. What I am is whatever observations I'm making through my senses in that present moment. And that's it. That's, that's us. Um, and maybe there's a little more to it than that, but I think it boils down to we're the observer. We're the observer yeah. as, as all of this is going on. And we're only observing a small, tiny little piece of the universe as a whole. We only have this one little single perspective that is blind to 99.9 .9, exponential nines after the, after the decimal of what's going on. Yeah. I, I think that, I think that's a, a nice summary of part one um, for, for surrender. I think maybe it would be helpful to just at the very beginning, give our definition of what surrender means from what he's saying. And, and, and it's to surrender the things that are false. That's really what he's talking about. Like, like, what do you assume about who you are and what your reality is? What, what about those assumptions are true? What about those assumptions are false? And if you surrender those things that are false, you're going to be opening up more towards truth, what's really there. And, and some of the things that he talked about in part one seem like this one, that the outside world is coming into you all the time. You're not really, like we have this sense of we're looking out, like we're inside of our body and we're looking out at the outside world. But that's an illusion. It's a hallucination that's created inside of our minds because of the senses from the outside world, these vibrations of energy that are hitting our eyes and our ears and our skin and, you know, doing this whole thing that's called sensing. And that, that is kind of mind-blowing to me. And he talks about color, how there's not really color out in the world. Color is something that happens as a result of the way that the light filters in through our eyes and our physical senses. And, you know, so really the way that we experience the world around us is determined so much by our biology and just this interaction. I think it's in that first 
that first one where he mentions that there's really only three things that are going on. There's the outside world that's coming in through our physical senses. There's what we think about what's going on. And there's what we feel about what's going on. That's pretty much it. Yeah. And there, as you hit on this idea that we generally as human beings, we sit in the space where we're having the outside world give some kind of impact on us. The reality is, too, that there are lots of things going on inside of us, too. Um, our organs are doing work. Um, there are sensations. There are feelings. There's Within our brain, there's these ideas of thoughts and emotions. Um, and, and, and again, this ties in, as you point out, this idea of, observ of, of observing color. The fact that color really isn't real, and it's only which... Uh, which pieces of these reflections are coming into our eyes and which aren't, which are being absorbed into the materials and which aren't. Um, you, you can take that, I guess, um, a step further. Well, when you say that color isn't real, like it's, it's, it's real, but, the, but the, the, real, the reality of the color is the interaction of the outside world coming in through our senses, the way that our senses evolved. So if you had, a, you had some sentient being that's sitting right next to you that has different rods and cones in their eyes they're going to be seeing different colors in the world around them because it's sensitive to you know the, these vibrations of light that are around us we're only filtering through this way so it's not that the color isn't real per se it's just that it doesn't exist in the outside world separate from the the experience that we have of experiencing it and i even wonder i wonder from human to human if red is still right. the same red if and you and you've played this game before i've i've played this game with my kids to try to explain to them how deep thoughts can be but the idea that if I say, look, I'm, I've never seen red before, never in yeah. my life, explain yeah. red to me. And you can't do it. And there's no way to capture a certain idea. Like language is insufficient unless another human being has actually experienced that thing for language to give the other person any idea of what it is you're trying to describe to them. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you remember what it was that you forgot? I, I don't. We'll have to just something. move on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I, here we are experiencing the world and we humans have such a limited view and we think we've got everything figured out. And the reality is we don't even, we don't know, what we don't know. And it's just been, it's been fun to explore the space uh, in these three episodes of, of what we aren't, how those things came to be, and then to begin to kind of point us inward and say, okay, um, those are the things we're not. Um, let's you know, start there, to edge at what we are. There, there's, a, there's a little piece of that statement that, that, and I don't remember exactly how you said it earlier, Bill, but like we're, we're nothing more than our conscious awareness, you know, that's kind of the, the summary of one. But it, that still, it, it doesn't feel like, it's totally right from the way that I experience it, you know, like I'm not my arm, I'm not my hand, I'm not my thoughts, I'm not my feelings. Well, but those are all the things that I'm constantly experiencing, feeling, thinking, perceiving. It's really hard to, to say, oh, well, there's something that's, no, I'm just the one that's experiencing all that. I'm not those things. But if, if I wasn't alive, I wouldn't be experiencing, you know, but so he did that experiment where you, you, you take off your arm, you take off your legs, you know, you can even have your head surgically removed and be on a heart lung machine or something like, like there's a lot of things that science could do where you would still be having this conscious experience, even if you're just like a head in a jar or something like that. But there's still something about life that's keeping, keeping you alive and providing that conscious experience that I guess, you know, people who have had near-death experiences will say, oh, my consciousness existed outside of my, my no longer living body. Um, but we don't really know. We don't really know if that's the case or not. So it does seem like there are these things that are going on inside of our bodies that are providing this conscious experience, providing us with life. And if I take that further, <laughs> I go, well, there's actually things that are going on outside of my body that are providing me with life too, like the oxygen that's in the air that I need to breathe or the, the water or the food, the nutrients that I bring in from outside and put into my body. And I start thinking about it more, realizing there's not, I mean, there are definitely differences between what's inside my body and what's outside my body, but all of them are contributing in some way. There's some kind of role 
contribution in making me who and what I am or who and what I'm experiencing. And uh, I don't know, it still seems a little kooky to me to be thinking that we're just this consciousness that's separate from our bodies. And I don't know if that's what this is saying or, or not, but it, it, and maybe it goes to that question of consciousness that, that you brought up earlier. Like, what is it? Where is it coming from? Um, but it, it, at any rate, I, I, think, I think I'm in danger of rambling at this point. So I want to- I've got a question. Yeah. This, this had me thinking a, a thought of like, what is, what is our motivation? Let's start with humans because I want to work backwards. But what's our motivation to endure life? Like we yeah. humans are going to die. Yeah. Um, and, and the idea of death, if we remove the bearded man in the sky idea of God and, and, and the limited understanding that we humans generally have, What's the motivation to get up in the morning and to endure another day of life? Like what keeps most of us moving forward with some sort of positive energy or positive approach to taking on each of these days before they come to an end? Oh, I don't know. You might get me, you might send me uh, back to bed, Bill, with that question. (laughs) I, I had a conversation with my daughter last night that uh, she's she's a sophomore down at University of Arizona in Tucson and she's just hating life right now with all of this covid quarantine stuff she's an RA in the dorms and she had all these fun plans on how she was going to interact with all of these new students coming in and they're not able to be in the same room you know they've got all these isolation restrictions on them her classes she can't go to the classes and she's like dad I, i'm i'm having a hard time just having the will to get up and do anything, you know? So it it speaks right to that question. What is, what is it? And and I asked her that, I'm like, well, what usually gives you that spark? What is that? And she couldn't answer that. It it had me concerned for her. So this, this question that you're asking me right now, Bill is um, hitting pretty close to home. Uh, And yet she still does keep going, right? She still does get up in the morning and take on another day and, I'm just curious what that driving force is for humans, because then we could back off and we look at other expressions of life and yeah. whatever our human reason is for doing it. I don't, I don't think it's exactly the same for why the tree does it or why the bacteria does it. Um, I don't know. This idea of perpetuating or experiencing the world seems to be the driving force on the human side. Like we have this evolutionary mechanism inside us that says we have to keep going and we've got to produce more of us. Um, and then there's also this sense of experiencing the world. What does today hold? Uh, what is today What is today going to have in store for us? What cool experience? What, what new thing? Because humans thrive on novelty. Humans thrive on uh, changing things up on a constant basis. And yet, I don't think that's the same motivation for other forms of life or lower expressions of life as we would see it, lower expressions of life. I just, I don't know. I think it's just a fun little sandbox to kind of play in for a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big one. And and I I think, you you know, the last time we talked, you mentioned the Enneagram, which is this personality typing system where there's nine different types of personalities. You've got systems like Myers-Briggs, where I think there's 16 different personality types You've got people who use astrology to locate what their personality is like uh, using the zodiac and their natal charts and things like that. And I think that's an indication of a lot of different answers to that question, Bill, that people, you know, like some people really do get off on novelty. Other people might want something consistent and just, you know, they they want to have the same thing every day and that routine and that security and, you know, a, a lot of different things that motivate people in their life but um yeah there there is some kind of driving force i've been watching uh a a documentary called seven worlds one planet that was recommended by uh, one of the listeners of our last discussion that uh, cammy and i met with last week it was kind of cool we went out had dinner and uh this this uh seven worlds one planet have you seen it bill i I have not yeah so it, it it takes each continent and goes and explores the wildlife on it has some of the coolest nature shots I've, I've ever seen. And one of the most amazing was this spider in Australia that's showing this female spider on a leaf and she's looking around for food. And at the edge of the leaf, there's this kind of little thing that sticks up. It's like, it's almost like a little 
peacock feather that's waving and it's a male spider that's underneath the leaf that's trying to get her attention with this little fan that he has on the end of one of his eight legs. And then, you know, it's like showing this little dance that he does as he's trying to show off for her and is, are they going to successfully made or is she going to kill him? And it, I love watching these kind of nature shows because I always, you know, there's always this tendency to anthropomorphize the other creatures, the other life that we see around us, but it's sure there were so many things about it that I like recognize Oh, I've got that instinct, <laughs> you know, the, that instinct uh, that I have in me that's been evolving for years and years and years uh, that I just inherited. Um, you know, like I, I get this, I come into this world. There's one of those Alan Watts sayings, you didn't come into the world, you came out of it. <laughs> but I come into the world with, with uh, this body that has been evolving through this process of hundreds of thousands of years. And it, it determines what, in a large sense, what my experience is in the world. But then there's other things that determine the experience. And it's every experience that I've had up to that point. You know, every person yeah. I've ever talked to, everything I've ever heard, everything I've liked, everything I haven't liked, the things that I want more of, the things that I want less of. And they're, they're, I think that forms like, a, has a very physical impact on our brain. I mean, kind of going back to that, what we said earlier, that tongue in cheek about changing the world through you know, what we're doing in podcasting, it, it, it's not untrue that there, there really is an impact on every experience that we've ever had. And it builds this thing, you know, what, what Michael Singer's uh, really building to in this eight core series is this idea of Sam scars, which he, he starts to introduce in part three. If, if I say the word Sam scar, Bill, do you know what I'm talking about from what you've heard so far? No. Okay. So the, he, he, if we summarize, we summarize part one, you're in here, right? You're, you're, you're the one that's having this experience. Part two, he, he talks a lot about how we're just a bunch of atoms. That's all we are. We're, we're a bunch of atoms that are arranged in certain ways that are doing certain things. And we're interacting with other atoms uh, out there in the world. But it's, it's all these little electric sparks of energy that were forged in the stars and he goes through that process going back 13.8 billion years ago to the big bang and the the main point of part two is saying you you're you're here you're experiencing the world around you a lot of times you feel like it's very very personal this experience but if you stop and think about it in any moment that you're in you look around and the things that you're looking at the things that you're interacting with you didn't have anything to do with them being what they are how they are they are a result, just like you are a result of 13.8 billion years of evolution of this energy that has been doing all of these different things at all of these different atomic, subatomic, molecular levels, cellular levels coming together just in this right way to give you this moment that you're in right now. And you really didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah, this moment in front of you is not your moment. And, and, you know, um, you know, Michael Jordan, I just watched, got done watching a documentary of the Chicago bulls during the run. And it's the a fast. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Oh, I, I really enjoyed it. I think there's yeah. 10 or nine or 10 episodes and yeah. really enjoyed it. Um, I was, I grew up in Ohio and I'm a huge Cleveland Cavaliers fan and my Cavs during the late eighties, early nineties, constantly ran up against Chicago who was in the same division. That Mark and, Price and yeah, Craig Elo, Bill, Bill uh, yeah, Doherty. Brad, yeah, Brad Doherty, Brad Doherty. Uh, Larry Nance, John Hot Rod Williams, yeah, and uh, and my team was good enough to get to the championship, except for a guy named Michael Jordan. And so, as I'm watching uh, the documentary, two things are going on. One is that there's this idea that athletes tend to really play up on, which is this is your moment. Like you, you took advantage of your moment. And, and we all can prepare and we can do the best we can and we can put our best foot forward, but the moment in front of us is not ours. It doesn't belong to us. It's, it, there's, this moment is happening all across the universe right now. And we just have this small little tiny little sliver um, of, of experiencing this moment and lots of other people, lots of other life, lots of other... Uh, inanimate objects are also experiencing this moment right now. It's not our moment. And it, and it is, I think, there to teach us that we are not as uh, important as we're telling ourselves inside our own head in some ways. And then in other ways, it's also designed to tell you like how miraculous mm. 
It is that you got to this moment right here. Again, just us having this conversation, Glenn, yeah. will impact that certain consciousness in the future that would have existed had we not had it will not exist. And other consciousness, uh, the consciousnesses that uh, would not have existed will simply yeah. because we've changed the someone going to the fridge three seconds later. And so now, you know, that impacts something else and impacts something else. And we really are in a sense, writing history, each of us, as we go through our life, the, we have no impact at all. And we have tons of impact at the same moment. Yeah. There's a, there's a phrase that I use in bathing with God many times um, that this is significantly insignificant that, that captures that, that, you know, in, in some ways we're not that important, but in other ways it is such a miracle that we're even here and no one is having the experience of being here in this moment that I'm having um, or that yeah. you're having. Like every single one is really precious in that way. So it, it, it is significantly insignificant. Um, but every, every moment is also an act of creation, like you say, you know, with, with the thoughts that you think, the actions that you do, that you, you put something out in the world where you in you influence the vibrations of all of these things that are going on and then those vibrations hit other vibrations it's a weird way of looking at it but it is really what's going on and th- this this act of creation and co-creating we're all constantly doing that uh, with each other we're all putting some kind of an influence out there and then we're choosing how we're going to respond to the influences that are that are around us so the other thing that happened with that documentary was there's a point towards the end of the doc of the of the whole series where uh, jordan had just won another championship he's in the locker room and the reporters are saying jordan are you going to retire are you coming back next year and he goes man let me let me enjoy this moment that moment will take care of itself i'll we'll i'll figure that out in october i'll i'll make a decision at some point but Right here, I just won. He just won a championship and people want to send him into thinking about the future instead of really like if any of us won, we just want to cherish this present moment, which is just gorgeous. You're the, you're the best athlete at your sport on earth and you just won and somebody wants to send you out of being present yeah. to worry about something else. Um, I find that just it's just fascinating, this idea of like really just enjoy this here, this now. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked here about the, the moment in front of you is not yours. I found this process that he goes into next. Uh, I, I could spend all day watching documentaries on how elements are formed and how the earth came together and what happens when suns are born and suns die. And as hydrogen piles on, the central region grows more and more dense until something brand new lights up the universe, a star. These first stars are hydrogen giants, 100 times or more larger than our own sun. Such massive stars are short-lived, two or three million years at the most, and they go out with a bang. An explosion so big they've been dubbed hypernovae. And it's with these cataclysms that the universe begins to accumulate the building blocks of life. All the atoms in the universe heavier than hydrogen and helium are forged by stars. Stars are really interesting. They, they don't just sit there. They know uh, that because they last so much longer than we do, we think they're, they're permanent. Stars are the ultimate alchemists. They, they turn light elements into heavier ones. They get the energy that they need to glow that way. The star begins its life made out of hydrogen and helium mostly, about 70% hydrogen, 28% helium in the case of the sun. In a star's core, the temperature and pressure are so high that hydrogen atoms fuse together to make helium. Hydrogen fusion releases prodigious amounts of energy, the heat and light of a star. That's the story for 90% of the life of a star, fusing hydrogen uh, to make helium. Eventually, though, the star runs out of hydrogen and begins to fuse its stocks of helium, making yet heavier elements. And so the way it works, and it always works this way, is that it contracts and it gets hotter. And if it can find something new to burn, whether it's the kitchen sink or coal or whatever, it'll burn it. Helium 
is taken three at a time to make carbon. You can add one more helium to that carbon and make element number eight, oxygen. That's a tremendous step forward. You get carbon and nitrogen and oxygen uh, made in stars. Now this is great because on the board we already have the principal elements of life. Organic chemistry is the chemistry uh, of carbon. Carbon fuses next and still heavier elements begin to form. Sulfur, argon, chlorine, potassium, calcium, scandium. The pace of this gets faster and faster. Back in the middle, silicon is starting to burn at three and a half billion degrees. Stupendous temperature. It makes titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, cobalt, nickel, and iron. Iron is really the end of the road. It's, it's sort of the nuclear turnip out of which you just cannot squeeze uh, anymore. It's the end of the game. A star that has relied on fusion has come to the point where it has nothing more to spin. The star is suddenly caught in a disaster. There's radiation going out from the outside, but deep in the inside, there's uh, no more fuel. Iron can't fuel the stellar furnace. And so, when a star builds up too much iron, it dies. The core collapses, it bounces. And it begins to move out, first slowly and then faster and faster. And that sends a very sharp wave back out through the star. And now what was falling down is going out, the whole thing's blowing up. And you've made a supernova. A supernova explosion can be as bright as four billion stars like the sun. A stupendous explosion. Such outrageous energies overcome the iron barrier cooking atoms into all the rest of the elements on the periodic table. So starting down here, you can go copper, zinc, gallium, germanium, arsenic, zirconium, niobium, molybdenum, strontium, rhodium, antimony, tellurium, iodine, xenon, cesium, barium, lapton, cerium, antinium, thorium, protactinium, uranium. Done. That's enough elements. We are all stardust. The carbon in our bodies, the iron in our blood, calcium in our bones. Every last atom is formed in a star. But it's not that simple. No one star can produce more than just a dusting of heavy elements. So, to create an environment friendly to life, the universe had to find a way to concentrate the good stuff, which it did in a process that is remarkably like the way Chef Michael Romano cooks up a bowl of soup. What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on, like, I don't know. It's just so cool. Like element one through 26 comes through, uh, you know, the big bang and stars forming and stars just living their life. And, and then these supernovas occur and now elements 27 through whatever, 92 or whatever there is. Um, what are your thoughts? I, I, it's, it's some of the most amazing stuff in the world. And it's amazing that we humans, again, no other life that we know of has gotten to this point. Maybe there's aliens out there somewhere doing their own science, but no other life on planet earth has, gotten to the point where it can examine these kinds of processes. Dolphins might, you know, people say dolphins are brilliant. Dolphins have been doing dolphin shit for, you know, millions of years. Uh, humans are constantly doing something different. Uh, your thoughts on like, I guess the awareness we have of these processes and the ability to even understand these processes that are out there in space, you know, what do you, what do you think about all that? Um, yeah, I, I, it's cool. I don't know. <laughs> what, do, what do I think about it? It's it's amazing. Um, yeah, can you give me a little bit more uh, direction? What uh, I just I'm just thinking about. You know, here we are. We're carbon based. We're these humans walking around, and we were talking about how we're a product of everything before us. And as I think about, like, okay, the Big Bang happens. Um, you know, hydrogen starts gathering together. Uh, it leads to, as it's pulled together, helium's created and fusion occurs. And then now you have atomic energy created by the fusion of hydrogen atoms. And hence, these first stars are created. And as that helium's pulled together toward the center and, and hydrogen is always dissipating to the outside, uh, the star expands. It becomes a red giant. You know, and our star, for instance, at some point will do that, become a red giant and swallow the earth. And this, this residue of stars dying creates new stars and now this helium fusing becomes carbon and and then you fast forward this carbon is us this carbon is us you know billions of years later and the process of life originating and uh 
evolution and, doing its thing and, and all, some of that, that ha- all that had to go into us being us in this moment. And, and some of that carbon is Michael Jordan <laughs> uh, winning that, that championship. And some of the other carbon is the reporter that's asking him to speculate on the future. <laughs> and Michael Jordan as that carbon saying, dude, I'm just in the moment. Just let me have this carbon moment right here, right, right now. Right. You know, like, I feel like we kind of do a, a little bit of that all the time. You know, whether we're focusing on the distant, distant universal past of how all of this was formed or the the future of like what would happen when entropy sets in and the universe, you know, like these these questions about like, what are we made of? How are we here? I think can also be a distraction from the current moment, you know, like where we are. But it, or, or it doesn't really become a distraction because it just because it becomes that that's what the focus of attention becomes in that moment. And 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 what I'm experiencing right now are my thoughts about what I think this past was with with these stars forging life or what the future is going to be. And it's all I'm having this moment of like I'm turning myself on by these thoughts right here, right now. And uh, it it's still just part of we're we're observing and we're creating this experience uh, with our minds in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's these two competing thoughts in these conversations. And I think I I try to represent one a little more strongly. And I think you try to represent the other a little more strongly. And I think they're both true. One is that we really are this, whatever we are, consciousness as well, by the way, whatever, whatever consciousness came from, and and maybe we, I, I don't think we really know that, but it, whatever it came from it, we really are this carbon that we're made up of these molecules we're made up of. We are the universe expressing itself as Eckhart Tolle said, we are the universe experiencing itself as a human for a little while. We really are the universe gathering in a new perspective, gathering in new data, gathering in new thoughts and feelings that no other expression of the universe ever before or after will gain. And, and yet your, I think the argument you're making at times in this bathing with God is that there's also something unique about us that, yes, God is in us, that creative energy, but we're also having this unique expression. There is something individual about us, even while there's also something completely not individual about us. And I find that that dichotomy or that juxtaposition between I'm really not me, I'm really the universe evolved to having this unique expression of itself. And I also am me. I'm inside me having this unique individual experience that separates me in some ways from the rest of the universe. And I, I find that that meetup to be one of the kind of the coolest things to have thought about in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And it, what, what, what Michael Singer is building to in this eight core series is this discussion about samskaras and samskaras is a, a Sanskrit world word. And I think it just means like a pattern um, he, they're the deep impressions that stay in your mind. They're, they're the, the programs that, that kind of run your show that these programs, these neural pathways that are formed by the way that we respond to the world that comes in through our physical senses. So, so there's those three things that we are, there's, there's the outside world that comes in, there's our thoughts and there's our feelings and our, our thoughts and our feelings are usually around something like, oh, I really like this experience that I'm having, or I really don't like this experience that I'm having. And you can have two people sitting in the same room experiencing the same thing, but one of them really likes it, one of them really doesn't. One of them wants more of it, one of them wants less of it. Why? You know, this speaks to that individualism that you're talking about. Why is it? You know, and, and if you go back and you look at each one of those people, where they've been in every moment of their life up to that point, they've experienced something different and it's felt a, quite different to them and then that just builds because our 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 brains take shortcuts you know and they're like oh if x then y it used to be like this okay well then i'll i'll do that do it again that way i'll 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 do it again that way and it's just like this constant repeating of patterns that become our thoughts that become our feelings about what's coming in through the world and i I think that's where the individuality the personalities come from and those preferences are built from a time that we're really young and we build this personality. We build this, like I, I picture it almost as like this bundle, uh, like a bird's nest of string that are neural pathways in our brain. They're all a little different in the way that they're shaped and formed and the, the way that they filter 
the experience of reality. It's all a little different for each one of us. But the, but the important thing that I learned as a result of this eight course series is that I'm the one who created that program. I'm the one who really determined the shape of that bird's nest by saying, oh, I want more of this experience or I want less of this experience. I really like this experience or I really don't like that experience. Like my, my reaction to what's going on around me has also shaped what my experience of that was. And then that determines kind of future experiences because you've got things like confirmation bias that, that you're forming this, this is how the world is. I just expect that this is how the world is going to be. This is how I like the world to be. I'm, I'm really only going to want to experience in this way. I'm not going to want to experience in this other way. And so you're only taking bits and pieces of what's actually going on. And, and, and that becomes you and that becomes your experience of it, but there is some control. So if you get to a point and uh, you know, this is what I, this is what I want to, to help try and help with my daughter <laughs> to, to understand, but also in my own life, if, if you get to a point where you can't find that, um, motivation to get up every day. Like, where is that joy? How, who's going to fix that? I mean, it, and it might be kind of a bleak thing, but you, you gotta have to take responsibility for it. And, and what are, what are the things that you're, what, what are you exposing yourself to? What pieces of the world are you experiencing? And then having your reaction against, I really like this. I really don't like this. Are, are you exposing yourself to things that are raising your cortisol levels? And creating more stress <laughs> or are you you know like what are what are you doing because we do have we do have some control some choice in in what we're doing and how we're building this samskara this this pattern of of behavior even though a lot of it is just kind of on automatic i don't know i've said a lot there bill that, tell me what you think no i agree i think at any moment we can interrupt those patterns simply by being aware that the patterns exist and go like, okay, if I don't, if I'm not enjoying my surrounding, not enjoying the experience. And by the way, there also is some Buddhism and just learning to accept experiences for what they are. And, and even the negative ones to somehow lean into those. But I think we can change our patterns. Um, both my parents smoked when I was uh, young, yeah. ashtrays on the living room table, um, I have COPD today, I think in part at least because of my parents being heavy smokers when I was young. What's COPD? Uh, it is where my, my, I have kind of like a constant asthma that doesn't just oh, really? come and go. It's kind of constant. And I, I take Advair, which is a medicine that I breathe in twice a day and it makes my lungs work better. But if I'm in places where I'm at high elevation or if I'm around air quality, that's not as good. Or if I don't take my medicine, I start to wheeze and I can't sleep at night. I also have sleep apnea. Um, and I think in part because of the COPD. So here's this, you know, all these processes and experiences that lead to me having things on my plate that maybe I wouldn't have had if my life experience had been different. But my parents were heavy smokers. And at some point, my parents decide they're going to quit. And, you know, who knows what went into that decision. But whatever life was throwing at them, they said, look, I don't want to be this thing forever. I don't want to experience this experience forever. I want to do something different. And they both made an attempt to quit smoking. My dad was successful. My mom was not. And there's a lot that goes into why it works and why it doesn't. But we do have opportunities in our life to attempt to and often succeed at interrupting the patterns around us. We, you know, if you don't like your job, sure as hell, it's scary to quit. Sure as hell, it's scary to go try something else. And yet, you could try something else and eventually you're almost assuredly going to get back on your feet doing something else. Um, there are people that float from job to job because they always want something new. There are people who just hate the thing they're doing and they go find the thing they love. Uh, we get to interrupt patterns at any moment and we don't get to choose the consequences of those interruptions, but it sure as hell changes what we were doing at the time. We get to make things move and shake. We get to, we get to impact things differently if we want to. Yeah. And, and, uh... You, you, you ended our last conversation by kind of teasing this idea of free will. <laughs> and I, I, think, I think that kind of cut ties in here because like your example as a kid with your parents smoking around you, that secondhand smoke had an impact on, on you for sure. That did you really have a choice in that situation that you were breathing? You know, you, you were, um, 
it was a result uh, and a consequence of your parents actions that had this this impact on you and then it kind of limits your ability like you can still make choices whether you're going to take this medicine or not whether you're going to treat your sleep apnea or not you know i want to exercise right and be in better shape my lungs have less fat to send oxygen to yeah so is it is it free will that you have like it's not kind of like anything goes um there are there are there are limits and parameters that are a result of you know the consequences of things that happened that came before you know which which is another way of showing how interconnected we all are how how the things that we do can impact and influence other people um and ourselves in ways that then uh can can form these habits and then some can form addictions and you know the the amount of power that your dad is able to exercise to overcome the 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 smoking addiction uh that your mom wasn't able to for whatever those reasons are you know like i i think it, it can get um tricky when people are saying well do you have free will to do that or do you not have free will to do it um there was a word that a friend of mine used in the past um bound will instead of free will this was um michael ferguson um for for those who know michael ferguson neuroscientist and um he he talked about these limits that we have but then there's a range there's kind of a spectrum that we can choose within but it's a bound it's it's bound on either side it's book ended by things that are kind of possible things that aren't possible right so it's not necessarily free but but how how did that work with your mom and dad was there did did she feel like she failed and there was a lot of guilt and stuff around that where your dad was able to succeed yeah it's interesting um I think she felt guilt. There was no one making her feel guilty at the time. She ended up pretending she quit and then she would smoke in secret. She would go out into the garage. She would sit in her car. She'd smoke on the way to work and back. She would find ways to smoke, but not do it in front of us. Not because she didn't want us to see it for any altruistic reason, just because she didn't want to feel the shame of not having quit. She wanted people to believe that she had quit. Yeah. And so she smoked uh, privately, but then, you know, it, you can't really do things like that. I remember when I left my re- religion mentally, I started drinking coffee in secret and my kids suddenly go like, Hey, every time we go to get something out of dad's car or whatever, we notice there's these empty coffee cups in the mm. back of his seat. You know, people aren't dumb. We all, we all can catch on to what other people's choices are. If we've, if we're given enough experiential yeah. data surrounding them, but my, my mother tried and she tried multiple times to quit and she just was never able. Um, I don't, again, like you say, I don't know what into that. I'm not, I'm not sitting here in some sort of judgment, like shame on her for not being able to and good for my dad for, again, right. we are somewhat limited. It, like you said, it's not complete free will. And, and the argument that there's no free will, I, I also think is valid too. Like the decisions you make in this very second is because of whatever happened behind you brought you to this moment. And you really don't have a choice, but what you do in this moment, like, and but you can choose on some level, again, I'm going to fight against that now. And on some level, I can choose to think about big questions or to read a new book or to, and every time I do something different, every time I interrupt my patterns of my life, I give myself new data inside my head uh, and I give my body new experience. And now my life will look completely different a year from now than if I didn't do that thing in this moment. I find free will to be an interesting question because on some degree, I agree a hundred percent. We have no free will. I can only choose in this moment what brought me to this moment to do. And at the same time, I also think I have some free will and yeah. ability to choose to interrupt my pattern right here, right now. What, what's the difference between free will and will uh, in, in the way that you think about it and the way that you're using it? I think sometimes free will is used to indicate you can make all choices. And I think all of us know like, I can't do anything. I can't do anything I want to. Um, I, I think the idea of will is that maybe there's more than one. And I think there is, there's multiple choices in front of us. For instance, I'm looking at my coffee cup right now and I'm thirsty. Do I take a drink while I'm talking to you? Yeah. Uh, or do I wait till I'm done talking and I push the mute button and you're speaking and I don't take a sip. You know what? I'll break it right here. Here we go. So I, I just wish, drink you, I wish w- 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 do it again and slurp. So I can okay, get more here we go. Right here. It, see, yeah. See, you you could have not slurped. Yeah. So now you now you impacted your will on me and asked me to do something. I could have said no, right? But I chose to do it. 
Yeah. Um, and now, now a year from now, now my life will be completely different because I just did that. <laughs> well, it already is completely different because you've got that slurp. It didn't have it before. Now it exists. <laughs> Creation. Boom. Right. So uh, I, I think we can interrupt patterns. And I, and I do think the more aware we are that we're aware, the more ability we have to change it up. So, so I, I think if we use your mom as an example, I, for, for two reasons. One, I think you, you went into judgment. And I think that, that's, that's a really interesting place to take this conversation. But before we, we go into judgment, the, the willpower that your mom used to hide it from you, from, from everything, like those, those are choices too. And those are, those are conscious choices. I'm, I'm still going to do this, but I'm going to cover it up. You know, in some ways it takes more effort to cover up the smell and cover up the, the, your tracks and, and do it than to just not. And, and so there's this, this hold that this substance has in, in addiction. There's this physical component and this, this drive that the body's saying, send me more, send me more. You know, I need more of this. You need more of this. Um, and you, am I going to respond to that? Am I not going to respond to it? Um, there, there, it seems to me that in most cases, people do have that kind of choice. I, am I going to suffer through withdrawals or am I not? Like I've, I've gone on no sugar diets many times in my life and, and going through sugar withdrawals is horrible. It just, uh, I hate it, but I did it. And, um, <laughs> but, but, but see that this is where the, the conversation starts getting into the, okay, well, I was able to do it. That other person wasn't able to do it. And you start getting into the judgment piece. And I think there's a choice to either judge or not judge <laughs> as well. You can't, you can't avoid making comparisons because that's just kind of what we're doing as the outside world is coming in through our physical senses. And we're all constantly comparing it to our past experiences and what we thought and felt about what was going on. But then when we start judging ourselves for falling short of this standard, which is an imaginary standard, but we've somehow accepted it and it becomes real for us. Um, or we're judging other people as this is good or this is bad. Like, I don't know if, if we look at your mom and dad, your dad was able to stop, your mom didn't. Is there a way to look at that and say uh, that wasn't bad, but your mom did? Or, or is, that, is there this taint of, uh, is it all constantly tainted with, uh, with judgment that it was a bad thing, it was a failure, it was uh, unsuccessful? the human mind races to go to ideas such as, Hey, my mom died of cancer uh, almost a year ago, a little shy mm -hmm. of a year ago. And she went to tanning booths all the time. It started off as skin cancer, ended up being brain cancer. And you wonder if the smoking contributed in any way to the cancer's growth. And cause she even smoked up until her last week, you know, mm -hmm. um, did that contribute? And, and if my mom's life, was cut short is is there a negative connotation for our human minds to think about it and again it is a fiction in terms of how we think of it because i got less time with my mom that to me is a negative but i'm the yeah. one imposing that label and um we humans decide like what we want and what we don't want and when we get things we don't want that's bad my mom continued to pretend she wasn't a smoker and to hide her smoking even after all of us in the home knew she was smoking and she knew we knew she was smoking. Mm. Like the, it was important for her to perpetuate the narrative even as it really doesn't, it's really not working. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like she needed the story even though we already knew the story wasn't true. And I thought like, that's crazy. And yet as my kids started to figure out I was drinking coffee and started to say, hey, dad, are you drinking coffee? And like, I'm like, they're not dumb. I continued to hide it for like several months. Uh, we humans need these narratives. They're important to us, right? Like the story of our life. We need these narratives. I, I need the narrative that I'm trustworthy. And yet if, if, I'm, if I'm honest, I work in a business where I have to constantly play in these areas of gray. Uh, I'm a pawnbroker. So people come up to my counter and they want to borrow money or they want to sell things. And I constantly have to try to get the best deal for my company. Right. right? So I'm constantly manipulating people into doing what I want them to do. And they're constantly manipulating me into doing what they want me to do. 
And, and there's a level of dishonesty on both sides of that, rather than just saying, hey, I know my knife sells on eBay for $250, and I think you making 30 bucks is sufficient, I'd like to give you 220 And on the other hand, I want to go, well, you know, here's the worst one on eBay, and it sells for $100. And so I need to, you know, I'm going to lose money shipping it, I'm going to only offer you 30 bucks. You know, this idea of these battles that go on in our lives every day, and yet we have these stories of who we are and what we are and what we do and what we don't do. And yet, as again, you keep pointing out and bathing with God, it's all bullshit. It's all fictions. You're constantly not what you claim you are. You constantly are other things you claim you're not. Um, it's just way more complicated than that. And my mom needed a narrative and I've at times needed a narrative. And whenever we tell people, Hey, tell me more about you. Well, I, you know, I like sports and I, you know, I, I like to play this. I like to play pickleball and I sometimes, you know, go on a hike and we're just, we're just telling stories and the stories are true to some extent. And they're also bullshit to an extent as well. What do you mean when you say, when you say bullshit, like I kind of like recoil a little bit when you, when you call it bullshit. Um, what, what, what do you mean when you say that? Um, when people say, Bill, tell me, tell me about you at your core. And I'll say, hey, I've got, you know, I think I've got integrity. Well, sure, sometimes. Other times I don't. I think every story we tell about ourselves, um, you know, I, I wear glasses. Well, at one time I didn't wear glasses. Uh, I love sports. Well, yeah, I do, but I'm not a big fan of curling and hockey. You know, I, everything, is, everything only approximates a better synopsis of the thing of the thing you're describing and it never it never hits the thing head on because again all language falls short language is a myth it's an invention of humans we we humans woke up one day and we created language and that language constantly falls short of describing the thing we're describing um even emotions you know i so i'm jealous right now well yeah you're jealous but you're also tired and cranky and there's lots of things you are and you're happy and you're static and Everything misses the mark and everything helps others get just a touch closer to what the mark really is. But again, it's is, true is there, and it's bullshit. Is there, is there really a mark? No, <laughs> that's probably a fiction too, right? <laughs> like, like why, why do I like sports? Uh, because my dad likes sports and I sat in front of the TV with him and watched it. And if, if I had grown up in a different home where I was taught to play the piano and went to concerts and played in the orchestra, like it'd been a whole different life. And now I wouldn't be a human being who likes sports. I just... We, we we're impacted yeah. by so many things and we attribute so many stories to what we are and the experiences we have. And it's just yeah. not real. Well, it is real. It's, well, it, yeah, it's, sure. It's, it's it, is, and it is real. It's absolutely real. And it's, it's, it's real as a result of these, the culture that we grew up in, you know, whether if that culture is your family and one of the things that you did in, with your family culture was sports and you really like, that, that connection and that interaction, that's how you guys connected. And so sports becomes the way you want to connect. Like my mom's like this, where there's this one card game called Idiot's Delight, which she used to play with her dad. And that was the way that she would connect with it. And so like when we get together, it's always, let's play idiots, let's play idiots. And, you know, okay, fine. I like playing the game idiots, but it's like the special thing for her because this memory she has, how she connected with her dad. And then last time we were playing it, she's telling that story again. And her husband's like, yeah, you know, I don't really think that, that uh, you connected with your dad actually when you're, you know, they started like debating all this stuff with it, but, but nevertheless, it's this pattern of behavior that continued over time because of the story that she was telling about what this card game means. And then it has an influence on me and my sister and my brother and, you know, and then our kids that are playing it. And, and there's, there's all of these ways that we influence each other, but, but what's being influenced, you know, like we, we are like our brains are these sponges that carry around everything that we ever interact with. And, and most of that stored in our subconscious. We're not, we're not really aware of it. We're not really aware of those influences that are going, okay, yeah, I'm going to lean towards wanting to watch this sports game or not wanting to watch this sports game. You know, it, it has to do with all of the experiences that we've come up with. And for, for the most part of our lives, we haven't been aware that we're carrying the sponge of a brain into certain places and certain things. And I know this is going to sound like a Sunday school lesson that I used to make fun of that, you know, there, <laughs> there, there I remember the Sunday school lesson where there, it was like a, a, a roll, you know, that, that little cardboard tube inside of a, a toilet paper roll and taking white cotton balls and pushing them in and then taking black 
cotton balls and pushing them in and saying, these are the pure thoughts and these are the dirty thoughts. And what happens when you put them in your mind, you fill your mind full with dirty thoughts. And, you know, so don't be a chewed piece of, of gum, you know, like all of these different stories that we were told as kids, but it's actually based on truth. You know, that our, our brains really are these sponges that absorb what we're around, what we expose ourselves to. Um, and then that has an impact on how we see the world. And there's that question, do we, you know, I, I don't have control of the family that I was born into. I don't have control of the religion that I was born into. I, but at some point I, I reached this critical point where I'm able to go, oh, is this really how I want to live my life? Or I want to make some changes. I want some things to be different. And I do have, you know, that, that will, bound will, free will, whatever it is, I'm able to make those choices and go, no, I don't want that for whatever reasons. And maybe my spouse who has been with me for so long is exposed to the exact same information, but is having a very different reaction to it um, because of all of her Sam scars, her past that the patterns of how you uh, respond to what's coming in, what you're exposed to. And, and it's just this dance, this interaction. And, and so what I, what I love about this eight course series and what I've been wanting to talk about uh, since I read it is that we're, what, what do you do once you realize I actually do have some degree of authorship over the way that I feel about the world? You know, these things that are coming in that I go, I want more of this. I want less of this. I like this. I don't like this. That is fundamentally what is shaping our experience of the world right there. We're kind of like, um, like, like a sculptor, like you've got this clay and you can, you can actually shape it. Even if the clay that's coming in is, a result of the culture that you're in, but there, there's some ways that you're able to, to shape it. It's not totally free. Anything goes free will, but it's, it's bound within these, these ranges and taking personal responsibility as much as possible for crafting the life that you want to live is really freeing and really empowering. And that's, that's the, that's the main point. I think Michael Singer is getting to, you know, he's building up in each of these three things that we listen to, who are you? You're the person that observes. You've got all. You, you've got the world coming in through your senses. You think. You feel. Um, and then, what are you going to do with that? Why? Why is it that you like certain things and you dislike certain things? And how do you change life? And and what he's going to say is, if if you're doing all of this because you 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 think that you're going to change the world to come in just the way that you like it, <laughs> you're kind of barking up the wrong tree. What you want to do is is get to a place where you accept things the way that they are instead of putting up, oh, it should be this way, but it's coming in this way. And so now I'm unhappy with the way that things are like you have you have contributed to your own sense of unhappiness in that sense, because you're saying this is how things should be. And it's not. Well, OK, what if you just accepted the way that things are and you were able to see? Yeah, there's there's bad things in it. There's also good things in it and bad and good are part of these constructs that we get from our society. And we get, you know, like it, it it's this whole ball of yarn that's, that's un, unraveling of what influences the way that we experience things. And I feel like I'm rambling again and I hate it. I got to no, no, stop I, rambling. No, no, I love, I love what you're saying. So it brings up a few things for me. So one is that I come into this conversation with you. You've already listened yeah. to all of them. Multiple and here times, I am, Bill. Yeah. And here I am just listening to this for the first time yeah. and having a conversation, not knowing what the ending is, right? Like, I don't know sure. what, what happens in the next six or seven of these. I just, yeah. I've listened to three. I've picked up what I picked up from those. Yeah. And so you're speaking going like, hey, this is where we're going to end up. Here's where we're going to take you. And I'm going, hey, I don't know that for sure yet. I'm not here. Mm -hmm. I'm not there. So I want to keep doing it that way because I think this is a fun way to do it. I'm, I'm going to come in having things rise up for me that I don't know that, what the conclusion is yet. Yeah. Um, so that is interesting. Uh, I've had numerous conversations with a friend that you'll, you'll, I think, you know, Thomas McConkie. I don't, you don't I, No, I've, I've heard, I've heard the name. Yeah. A few times, not even a lot, but yeah, I don't know Thomas. McConkie. Thomas left our religion as a young kid. Uh, and then as a young adult, went to China, took up Buddhism for years and years, and then comes back and joined this religion that we both left. And, uh, and in doing so, he's this Buddhist approach that he has. I've sat in conversations with him where he spoke to this very thing we're talking about, which is my life experience has brought me to this moment. And this moment feels so similar to other moments. I'll give an example. When my kids, I, 
I have one brother. We're four years apart. My wife is one of eight children. My wife grew up with chaos. My wife had the noise and chaos of seven siblings running around and mom and dad who dealt with having eight kids pretty well and didn't get lost in the chaos, but allowed these kids to make some noise and to, to kind of run around a little crazy. I have one brother. We're four years apart. We almost kind of grew up on our own separately from each other in some ways. Like there's such distance in time and there's only two of us. And so my mom, my mom and dad kept a very quiet, orderly home. My wife and I have four children and our children are somewhere in the middle of that in terms of noise and chaos going on in our house. My wife is looking at these situations going like, this is no big deal. We had twice as much chaos going on. And, and I come from the perspective like, oh my God, this is driving me crazy. And so whenever my kids would get noisy, in, inside me, I would have these sensations of turmoil. Yeah. I'm being disrupted. And in my disruption, it is natural. It became natural for me because of these patterns to ask my kids to be quiet. And not only that, but to yell and scream at my children. Hey, guys, mm -hmm. knock it off. Like, this is too much. Settle down, you know? Yeah. Here we are. Fast forward. I'm 41 years old. I still have two kids living at home. Uh, my oldest son now has a baby. So there's a grandchild. And sometimes there's still chaos. My oldest son and my youngest son sometimes still want to wrestle on the floor. As that chaos is happening, it feels like the exact same moment that's happened a thousand times before where I would yell and I would scream. And I could. It feels very natural for me to just start telling people to knock it off and telling people to settle down. Thomas, in one of these conversations with me, explained like, yeah, you, you come into every situation thinking it's just like the situation that's happened 10 times before or a hundred times before or a thousand times before. So you, without being aware that you're aware, you yeah. naturally right. choose to respond the way you've always responded. He says, I like to pretend I'm holding a bowl of water. And in that water is all those past experiences. And at any moment, if I'm aware that I'm aware, I can take that bowl of water and just dump it out, just dump it out. And I can now sit in this experience right here as if it's a brand new experience, unlike any other I've ever had before. And I can now in this moment, even though there's a sensation in my body, he says, the moment you name that sensation, I'm angry, I'm jealous, I'm frustrated. He says, the terrorists are already in the cockpit. You can't, you can't fix it at that point. You've already named it, which now, now your brain has to start attributing corrections and, and procedures to, to address that thing. He says, just try, when the, when the moment that sensation comes up, try not to name it. Just sit with it. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm feeling disrupted inside. I don't want to name it. And now this experience that's happening in front of you, because you're aware that you're aware, you can choose. And I've done this and it doesn't happen all the time, but when it happens, it's magical. I've had times where my kids are doing the thing they've always done, even though it's a new experience. And rather than react and do the thing I've always done in response to that, I sit there still allowing myself just to feel this disruption. And I go, I'm going to show up in this moment different than I ever have before. I'm going to intentionally not yell, not scream, not tell my kids to settle down and just try to enjoy them being them in this moment. And what happens is you get to start to take a little bit more control of what your life looks like. And so instead of reacting to everything, you start to respond to the world. And that looks so different. And it's, it feels, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe this is a fiction, but it feels so much healthier to be present in the world responding than to not be present in the world reacting. Yeah. And, and I, I you know, there's, there's the parts of me that are really cynical as, as, as I listen to, to this and I start picking it apart because that's part of, that's just part of my background. That's part of like my Sam Scar stuff as I, I, I go, yeah, but yeah, but, um, the, the, reacting versus responding, I think is, is one of those kind of like little cute ways that we're playing with words like, Oh, we're doing it the right way, but not the wrong way. And the difference between the right way and the wrong way is really, really subtle. But if you, if you focus on it enough, you can do it. And, and I have this reaction against this. that like, that almost seems like it's setting up like, Oh, okay. So there's still a wrong way. And I'm going to 
mess it up. I'm going to do it the wrong way. So if it doesn't get the, the outcome that I think is good, then I did it somehow the wrong way. Okay. That's, that sounds like a very familiar way of naming my experience of existing in the world, <laughs> you know, that, okay. But, but I, what, what I hear you saying, Bill, is that you, you recognize that for a long time you were, you were kind of on automatic in the way that you would respond to your kids because you have this if X, then Y program running in your mind that has been formed all throughout your life, you know, starting with the way that your family was a smaller family than your wife. You didn't have as much chaos. She had more chaos. You know, her F, if X, then Y, if X is the kids are wrestling on the floor, then Y is oh, well, this is, this is normal. This is a perfectly happy home. I'm happy with it. And so she's totally content with you. It's like, if X, there's this kids wrestling on the floor, it's noisy, ah, that's disturbing me. Then shit's you know, going to get broken. Yeah, yeah. things are going to get broken, you know? And, and that you've, you've been running that automatic program that's really coming up from your subconscious. You're not aware that you're, that's why, because it's just boom, boom, boom happening in the moment. But, but once you start going, oh, I want to try to, put a little space between myself and the time that I react to the time that I respond. I want to start paying more attention to what I, I can feel these sensations rising up. I'm starting to get annoyed. Oh, what is that? I'm going to reverse engineer this feeling and try to figure out what are the thoughts that are creating the feeling uh, of being annoyed and what's the experience going on? Oh, I remember I don't want to be this way. I want to be this different way. Okay. How do I respond to be this different way? I want to be more calm. Okay. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to take a breath. I'm going to separate myself from it. You, you've you've kind of hacked that if x then y program to go okay if if x then y to the second or y to the third you know something like that i'm going to i'm going to change i'm going to rewrite that program i'm going to rewrite that neural pathway but it's an act of will e- even even if you're you know, using the image of a bowl of water that you're dumping out i mean i i think that's a that, that can be a really powerful tool and a really helpful tool but i don't think that that we're really able to just empty out all of the information that's in our subconscious mind so that the next time if X comes up, it's not, you know, using all of the experiences in the past that were similar to that to make that comparison again. It, it's just, it, it's the, the way that I think of it is in the way that I've experienced it. It's like flexing a muscle that has either been on atrophy because I've been doing automatic programs my entire life, or I start learning how to be more intentional in those moments to respond in the ways that I want to respond. And, and how do I want to respond? Do I want to get angry? Do I want to get loud? Do I want to get mean? Or do I want to relax? Do, do I want to be kind? Do I want to be loving? Um, and go, okay, this is really how I want to respond. This is really how I want to feel in this. And, and it, it, does take, it does take effort and it takes training because what, what you're up against is this, this uh, brain of ours that is just the sponge. It's such an amazing sponge that's a computer. <laughs> it's this biologically evolved supercomputer that makes all of these calculations like, and all the things that it's doing just so that we can have this conversation. You know, like the, it's, and it's, it's trying amazing. to keep your experience satisfactory to you. It's trying to yeah. control the outside world to keep things the way you want them to be so you don't yeah. feel the disruption. Right. And at times it doesn't give a shit whether it's disrupting other people. It doesn't care whether it's making things inconvenient for someone else. It's yeah. only concerned that it keeps life uh, as pleasant and as comfortable as it can for you. Yeah. Do, do you remember the movie Parenthood? with Steve Martin. Yeah. Yeah. That there's that scene at the end of the movie where um they they give uh, a metaphor for life with a roller coaster. Dave called. He was crying. He actually cried. He said if I'd come back to give me a corner office with new furniture and a raise. Like that's supposed to make up for everything. Anyway, I, I took the job. I, I couldn't think. I was still high from the little league game. Isn't that demented? That a grown man's happiness depends on whether a nine-year-old catches a pop-up? I mean, what if he missed? But he didn't. But he could have. But he didn't. But he could have. But he didn't, Gil. <laughs> you threw him 12 million pop-ups in the backyard. You cut the odds considerably. If he hadn't, ow, ow. But there's three of them, and you want to have four. And then if the fourth one could be Larry. And they're going to do a lot of things. I mean, baseball's the least of it. And then all those things sometimes are going to miss. 
Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they will. Sometimes they, Sometimes they will. What do you want me to give you? Guarantees? These are kids, not appliances. Life is messy. I, I, I hate messy. It's, it's, it's so messy. You know, when I was 19, Grandpa took me on a roller coaster. Oh? <laughs> up, down, up, down. Oh, what a ride. What a great story. Love it. Well, I'll be seeing you in the car. She's a very smart lady. Come on, Taylor, your ears are ready. Yeah, a minute ago I was really confused about life and then grandma came in with her wonderful and affecting roller coaster story and now everything's great again i happen to like the roller coaster okay as far as i'm concerned your grandmother is brilliant come on taylor come on hurry up Yeah, if she's so brilliant, how come she's sitting in our neighbor's car? And, you know, like the ups and downs of the roller coaster make him nuts, you know, I mean, kind of the way that you described yourself with, with this chaos in the house and just getting uptight. And he has this moment at the end where things are really falling apart, but he thinks of it in the terms of a roller coaster and he kind of lets go and he goes with the ups and the downs of it. You know, I think they're at a school play and his son runs up on stage because his daughter is getting uh, hurt or he thinks he's getting hurt. It's just part of the play. And it just kind of creates all this chaos. And there's some people that are like, oh, no, this is horrible. You're ruining it. And then there's other people who are like, oh, this is funny. We're like We like this better than the, the play was. And they're enjoying it. And he kind of, he, he, in that moment, makes that switch of instead of being one of those people, oh, you're ruining it because it's not going the way it was supposed to be. You're finding the, the joy and the humor of the spontaneous reaction that this little kid is doing to go up and save his sister on the stage and appreciating that for what it is instead of not appreciating it because it wasn't something that should have been the other way. Um, so that this, this life that throws the unexpected at us, how are you going to take it? Are you, are you going to ride with it? as a roller coaster, enjoying the ups and downs and just experiencing them for what they are or say, Oh, life is only acceptable 20% of the time when it comes in the way that I like it. And then the 80% that I don't like, it's unacceptable. And um, so life just sucks. And taking that main uh, way of living in life or always constantly trying to control the world. And so that it comes in just the right way. Um, that That's, yeah. that's what Michael Singer is trying to, to wake people up to and saying, are you doing that? Is it working for you? If so, great. Keep doing it. If not, maybe you want to try to just ride the roller coaster of life and enjoy it. And really, you don't, like, again, we think in our head, any moment I can control the outside world, and I can make sure that I'm only having pleasant experiences. The reality is, and we all, we all get it, we all sense it, and because it's just the way life happens, is that life is good and bad. There are, there's pain and there's joy, and, and those are constantly happening and sometimes happening at the same moment. Um, there, there is, once you learn to accept, and I'm not there yet for sure, for sure. Once you, and maybe nobody really gets there. Like again, some of these wise minds, Eckhart Tolle is a, a claims that he's completely shed his ego. And part of me goes like, nah, give me an hour with him. I don't know. Mm. Um, but maybe some people have, but the idea of like, com just completely accepting things as they are, you obviously still show up and you still do the best you can with your life. But when things don't go the way you want them to, just learning to accept that, does, I think we can be better at it. I don't know anybody's nailed it. You know, it's, it's kind of like um, any of these people that claim that they're just, again, if Michael Singer claims that he's surrendered completely, I don't know if that, that would be his take or if every moment he's just trying to surrender in that moment and he succeeds sometimes and he fails sometimes, which is what I suspect happens. <clears throat> but anybody who claims that, you know, I've, I've, I've nailed it, I've perfected the course. Uh, I don't know. Give me an hour with you. Give me a baseball bat and give me an hour. And let's see. Let's see if you surrender. You know, I think some things in life are deeply tragic and those tragic moments, some of them are so bad that I don't think we have any choice, but to wish we're not there. Um, and, and I think there are situations where people are in such pain or trauma or 
um, having the hardest moment of their life that as much as we say, like, accept it, I don't know that you really can. I think there's part of us that always wants to escape uh, the hard moments. Yeah. And I think that's natural. I, you know, I don't, I, I don't think of this stuff as like, um, okay, I'm going to make myself less human and, and I'm going to strip myself of the ego. And I mean, we could spend time talking about what that even means, what, what an ego is. And I, 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 the way that I understand the ego, it would be impossible for Eckhart Tolle to strip himself of it. But, but it would be, I think, quite possible to, to master. I, th- I think you just kind of like reshape what your ego is and how you're going to respond to things. And, and that's really what this is about um, in, in being more accepting and being less judging. But, but recognizing you can't help but be the experience of the world or, or experience what's, what's around you. You can't you can't help experience what's around you, and you can't help have the having these automated thoughts that are just going to come up. These these feelings that are associated with the thoughts that are just going to come up. Um, but then in that space of responding to it, I, I think that's that's been my experience of it, and I'm not a master of it either. But I have mastered it in a short amount of time, much more than I ever thought that I could. Like I I have shocked myself in probably two or three months. Um, how I'm able to make changes in the way that I respond to dealing with like an (laughs) ex-wife, you know, dealing with, with my kids, dealing with um, people in the workplace. I, I, I have a very different response. Like I carry myself differently. I feel differently. People recognize it when they interact with me. Um, And I, I mean, I, I'm I'm no Buddhist monk, you know, <laughs> but I, I I have I have found much more. I, I I was with some friends of mine the other night, and they asked, "How do you find peace? Like, how are you finding peace?" And and the, these are friends that uh, still attend the the church that shall not be named. So it was one of those really interesting kind of tenuous discussions where, like, <laughs> I, I won't get into, go into the whole thing, but but um, it, it was a recognition that. Um, I, I, they, they were recognizing that I do seem to be more at peace than I have in the past with things and how yeah. that happened. And it, and it's, it's come from accepting, Oh, this is why this moment, this is why in this moment I'm feeling like a failure. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not really a failure. It, it feels like, it feels like failure and I, I understand and I'm going to feel it and I'm going to accept it for what it is. I'm not going to bury my head in the sand. I'm not going to try to push this away you know, that this is a feeling that I don't like. Um, all right, just I kind of breathe and relax my body and just let it be what it is instead of like going, oh, this is like judging it and trying to push it away. And that, that's been the way that I've been trying to, to do it. And I think it's been helping. I'll just leave it at that. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so part three, maybe help, you know, help me or, or kind of remind me of some of the ground that he's covering in this third this third yeah. uh, uh, conversation well, he has in part three, he gives this really great comparison. I thought of like a, a plasma TV. And I, I don't know if you remember in those early days of getting plasma TVs, you, they, they cautioned you not to pause the screen because if you pause it, then the plasma in the screen would freeze into place. And you would always have kind of like these, these shadow images in, in the past. Yeah. Um, so he yeah. used that as an, al- an analogy to talk about our minds, to talk about our brains. And the, the way that when we, when we resist the things that are coming in from the outside world, when we resist our thoughts, when we resist our feelings, it's kind of like pushing pause and having that plasma uh, screen freeze. And then there would become like these phantom images that are in our brains, that are in our mind, our neural pathways, that then no matter what's coming in through the senses, it's always there as like this physical thing that's kind of filtering so, so there's always this little touch of, oh, this is, this is one of those things that happens that's bad. This is one of those things that happens that I like, you know, it kind of freezes it in our minds that way. And maybe, maybe just ending by, by leaving with that thought. And, and um, my, my challenge, uh, maybe before we talk again, Bill, is to just pay attention to this idea. If, this, if, if you experience that happening, like the, that kind of frozen plasma screen on your mind if if you have any experience what do you think about that no i think it'd be interesting to come back the next conversation and 
as, as we're thinking about these things and as we're experiencing life right in front of us yeah. to come back, because now I'm going to have, a, you know, three more episodes, three more presentations to listen to and to see what kind of rises up in my actual experiential data and to see what sticks and what isn't sticking, you know? There, there's this, this place that I, I'm going to insert this. Um, it's at the 51 minute mark of that third course. And he basically says, I don't, I don't want to buy into this garbage that I am the person who likes this stuff or doesn't like this stuff, who wants more of this stuff and wants less of this stuff. Spirituality isn't uh, the way to use a magical power of thinking of thought to try to get what you want and avoid what you don't want. He says, if, if you think that that's what spirituality is, is a way it's going to help you get more of what you want and less of what you don't want, you're barking up the wrong tree. Because I, I, I want to be the one who experiences every experience for what it is and to be grateful and in awe that you get to witness and experience this moment that took 13.8 billion years to get here exactly like it is that you're in. So spirituality is the way of freeing yourself from the illusion that you're responsible for what's going on in the moments around you. Um, and that you're, what did I write here? I wrote spirituality is uh, to be free from the illusion that I've, yeah, I'm not, that I am anything other than the experience of what I experience. I don't really know what I meant when I wrote that, but I, but I do want to, I, I want to play that clip, not right now for you, but I'll insert it. Um, and it just makes me think about all the stories that we make up in our head that tells yeah. us, this is what's going on. And is, is that real or is that bullshit? <laughs> that those aren't, those aren't mutually exclusive. The bullshit is real and has an impact on our experience of the world. This, so just, this pay, stuff is, just paying attention to that. Yeah. yeah. This stuff is real to me. Like these conversations are real to me in that in the last year, my wife and I, we have a good marriage and we get along really well. And, and that's still true. Like here we are 23 years. We celebrated 23 years, uh, six days ago. 23 years after, you know, getting married and, and we get along in some ways better than we ever have before. And yet I've also in the last year realized that every story I used to tell in my head about what our marriage was and who she was and how she thought and what those thoughts were. And it's, it's just not real. She is experiencing her own thing inside her head. That's completely different than what I'm experiencing inside my head. And I don't even have the ability to comprehend the experience outside of my own head inside someone else. I can pick up little parts and pieces, but again, it's always missing the mark. And so you, you just, you're just learning to coexist with other humans having experiences completely different and not to rock their boat too much and they not rock yours and try to be out there for the betterment of each other. And I think this, these kinds of conversations really help us, at least they help me, be a better version of me and be kinder and more compassionate to people around me and make more space for them not to do things the way I want them done and not to do things the way I need them to do it to make my world at peace and to give them space to just do the world the way they need to do the world. Yeah. Um, so I'm really appreciative of this. I'm looking forward to the, the next three getting a chance to listen and to revisit this here in another week or two. Yeah, and 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 I I appreciate the the opportunity for the conversation too. I I think you you might be able to hear I I'm still like I I like these ideas. I, I obviously you know I I said let's let's listen to this eight course series by Michael Singer and talk about it because I really like the ideas that are in it. There's still times where I come across some of these things and I'm like I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm still kind of kicking the tires with some of them, um, and and I I pick up on little contradictions that. Um, Oh, we say this, but then there's also this part, and and I get a little confused with it sometimes. Um, you know, th things like when you say missing the mark, and I go, well, is there really even a mark? Because I thought that we said that there isn't a mark, and and there isn't like a right way or a wrong way to do things, but that's definitely the wrong way to do th do it. <laughs> you know, like a, th those kinds of messages that um, I. I really don't ever want to go back to a place of dogma, you know, where, where there were like so much of what the first and first quarter, first third of my life um, being uh, de devout scriptorian in certain ways and having, you know, the scriptures say that this is how you're supposed to be. And so we're always quoting, this is how you're supposed to be. This is how you're supposed to be. Okay. I don't want to just 
uh, replace those scriptures for a Michael Singer or for a Thomas McConkie or for, you know, like these other gurus or an Alan Watts and go, okay, yeah, these are my, these are people now that are telling me this is how things should be. And so we have I, new rules. Yeah. We have new rules and new ways to fail. And if, if I don't do it the right way, then I'm doing it the wrong way again. So there's, there's still times yeah. when, I'm, when I'm engaging this material and I kind of pause, I'm like, is this, is, 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 am I doing it again? Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I really have felt, um, more peace in my life come as a result of this stuff that the Michael Singer, the untethered soul, this eight core series. And then immediately afterwards, I read this book called letting go by David Hawkins. And I think it was the combination of all those things where I was, you know, th- th- this was like part of covid <laughs> we're, we're all like uh quarantined in and cammy and i are having these experiences reading this stuff talking about it changing the way that that she and i interact with each other and going wow this is working this is really good and then getting excited and oh let's go and let's share about it oh great i'm becoming a missionary again <laughs> and, I'm, and i'm proselytizing wait is that really what i want to be doing or coming across as so i so i just want to acknowledge that i i I have all of this, this paradox, these like messy ideas going on um, in there. So just want to acknowledge that that's there, Bill. Yeah. And, and also, you know, to people who are listening to this, they're, it's going to mean something different, you know, like as much as I want to recreate my experience, yeah, of, oh, this was can, just so can awful, we? awesome for me, you know, and I want everybody, I want to pull the fruit from the tree and give it yeah. to everyone like Lehigh. Yeah. Oh, did I, did I break the rule there? <laughs> I want to share it. Um, but uh, yeah, everybody's going to have a different experience with it and, and come at some of these things from different, different ways. Uh, but yeah. yeah, for some people, this is too foo-foo for some people. This is oh, totally. things they learned two decades ago. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or, or, or things that they tried and didn't work for them. And they're like, you guys are heading for a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Or they learned something like completely that. different. That's cool. That's helpful to them that we didn't even pick up on. Yeah. Cool. I'm excited about the next conversation. So if you'll send me the the next two or three audio pieces you want me to listen to and I'll start working at them. That's good. All right. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye.